All right, so uh, this is a paper um, that's, first of all, let me thank the organizers. Uh, let me thank Rob for um, already uh, doing a great job at um, basically describing the, 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 the simple point of the paper. Um, and at the same time, also getting at kind of the tough spot that I wanna spend some time talking about and, and, and maybe have a discussion afterwards, which is, you know, what, what do you make out of all of this at the end of the day? And, um, you know, particularly about uh, do investors ultimately choose um, the constraints under which their managers operate? And is that not potentially more important than finding the right manager to then um, implement that constraint? Yes, particularly in the ESG example he gave. Um, so uh, this is a joint paper with Alessandro Baber, um, Jason Sen, and uh, Ken Cavallas. And um, as Rob already described, yeah, the, the basic point of the paper is um, very straightforward, which is that if you open up a prospectus for a typical mutual fund, you'll find in it a lot of details as to the rules of the game, what the fund is allowed to do and not do. And so the point of the paper is very simply that the performance of a manager ought to be done within the context of those rules of the game. Um, and that at times, and, and you know, kind of the main contribution we think of the paper is to illustrate how um, those rules of the game actually can significantly affect um, the potential return that a manager can generate and therefore ought to also um, affect the benchmark to which a manager is either compared or maybe internally um, evaluated. And we'll get to that in, in just a slide or two. Um, let me oh, make sure, let me start with an example. Um, so this is a uh, mutual fund um, prospectus, and um, it's a, a, a capital growth um, fund, which is a particular subset of mutual funds. It kind of lies in between the spectrum of um, index funds, which have relatively little lenient, uh, relatively little freedom to deviate from the index because their primary objective is to um, replicate the index within some tracking error. And on the other side uh, of the extreme, perhaps hedge funds or total um, total return funds that can basically do anything. Um, these intermediate set of funds, which are the ones that we'll end up studying empirically, um, have significant rules around what they're allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do in terms of the index that they're roughly tracking, uh, the industry exposures, the single stock exposures that they may or may not take and so forth. So this is kind of a, an interesting example to study. Um, before we get into the empirical work. Um, so here's the empirical um, kind of experience of this fund. Um, you know, the return um, plotted into expected return or average return in this case, historical um, risk dimension with a four factor efficient frontier in blue and really, you know, the capital market line in red, um, the market being over here. So you see this is a fund that takes a little bit uh, less risk than the market uh, and generates a return that is um, you know, a little bit lower than that of um, the market return and uh, significantly lower than what you might achieve taking the same risk on the efficient frontier. And, and that's sort of the point of traditional um, mutual fund evaluation is to say, well, this, this mutual fund in an ex post context isn't really doing all that well. And, and why is that? And you know, in a population as Rob pointed out, this is sort of an empirical puzzle um, that after fees, the universe of mutual funds don't tend to be on the efficient frontier. Um, we're gonna take a slightly different view on, on how to measure um, performance and think about it at, from a perspective of excessive risk taking. So for the same average return generated, um, how much more risk does this fund take relative to what uh, it needed to take? And, and the amount of risk it needed to take to be on the capital market line would have been right here. My, well, my pointer is and uh, the difference, the horizontal difference is that underperformance that we talked about. So if you look at that um, prospectus and you start reading it, you know, our thinking is that you know, we're starting to wonder whether uh, the capital market line really is the right and fair comparison to draw. Um, after all, this point right here on the frontier involves a certain amount of risk reborrowing and then uh, a, a further amount of uh, or an offsetting amount of investment in the maximum sharp ratio portfolio, which sits up here somewhere above the market portfolio, probably involving some significant short selling um, and leverage. And uh, those are unfortunately things that the fund is not allowed to do. So one of the things that uh, the perspective is very clear about is that this fund may not borrow, lend cash 
um, in excess of what is needed for day-to-day, month-to-month um, flow. So really it's facing um, the blue efficient frontier and you know maybe the appropriate difference uh, to to analyze is you know the difference between the fund's average performance and that frontier but it turns out the fund's not allowed to short sell either so uh, we need to instead construct that efficient frontier with a no short sell constraint uh, the fund also has to be well diversified um, it cannot hold more than five percent of its assets in a single name um, so that gives us yet another frontier and um, finally, the fund's sector composition. So the amount of assets deployed in industrials versus consumer discretionary versus financials or healthcare, et cetera, has to roughly match that of the index within certain bounds, um, which we can um, measure. And so you know, that further changes the efficient frontier. And so the point of the paper very simply is that when you're looking at a particular mutual fund, um, and we're looking at this one, for example, um, the efficient frontier to which you want to compare it in order to determine whether or not this mutual fund uh, manages to outperform um, given its mandates uh, depends on the specific constraints and mandates of that particular manager, which in this case would be the turquoise line instead of the red line, um, we would argue. So um, the basic question um, or point of the paper then is um, that if you look at two funds, they will have different prospectuses that will line up, line out, outline different sets of rules of the game. And therefore, since no two funds are the same, um, the benchmarks to which you then want to compare them or might want to compare them um, should also not be the same. Um, but instead, what one should do is, as Rob uh, already suggested is build a bespoke customized benchmark for every manager that as well as possible replicates the constraints under which that manager operates in order to then measure under those specific constraints how well does the manager uh, do his or her job. And so this is this is where we then get into you know the the, the issue that Rob already brought up. You know if, if this is true if you know you want to evaluate managers relative to um, a set of constraints, then you, you start, you have the second dimension of a problem from the investor's perspective that the investor needs to now not only find um, a good manager, but he has to firstly, and, and we show, you know, as a second, as a first order effect, has to also find the fund with the appropriate constraints to implement. And, you know, the, to the extent that uh, constraints are more binding, uh, the, you know, there's less room for outperformance. Um, and, and therefore, the, the, the first piece of, of the problem becomes less important. And, and so that's hard. And it's a big assumption, uh, I think, or we think, uh, that to assume that investors can actually look through these two layers of choice. Um, first, finding the right institutional infrastructure under which the fund operates. And then secondly, find um, the right management team, um, maybe within that fund family, to, uh, to uh, run the fund. And so over time, um, and, and certainly in the last latest version of the paper, we've started shifting focus and discussion a little bit away from this two-dimensional investor problem. I rather started to think about, you know, if you were a fund board member or you were a, a part of a larger fund family, how would you think about various managers' performance, given that, you know, in this case, you've actually put these constraints in place, um, you know, as, as a board or as a fund family, you, you constructed the institutional framework under which the manager operates. And therefore, it is only fair to consider that framework when evaluating whether the manager does a decent job within that uh, set of constraints. Um, Michael, uh, Neil Stodden had, had a question. Is this any different than just calculating an alpha with respect to some Vanguard mutual funds that are only long? Um, so yes and no. Certainly, it, it, it would be no different than perhaps calculating the alpha with respect to a second fund that shares all the same institutional constraints as the first one does. Um, so, so that's certainly true. If you could find apples and apples um, and compare them, that would be a valid comparison. But um, to compare a um, one fund that's, let's say, Vanguard fund um, 
to another fund that has institutionally a limit on how many stocks it can hold. So for example, in our university or mutual funds that can, can that have to hold 25 stocks or less. And so, uh, you know, drawing that comparison between a highly concentrated versus a highly diversified fund is it, simply not an apples to apples comparison. And that's where we would argue that the relevant benchmark to compare this concentrated manager to would be something that mimics the same level of concentration risk. Um, so what we want to do in the paper, uh, I want to keep an eye on my time here. What we want to do on the paper is uh, develop a methodology, propose a methodology to um, build a bespoke comparison portfolio to which to compare the manager to. And the basic idea here is that we're, we're solving a, essentially solving the fund manager's problem under the fund manager's constraint. Um, looking at, well, ex post, given, you know, the historical performance of, uh, you know, various characteristics in the cross section of stocks, um, how well did the manager do relative to how he or she could have done within the set, same set of constraints, um, given the historical data. Um, we're going to do that uh, using or expanding on some work that I had done with Pedro Santa Clara and Ross and Balkanov. Um, really uh, customizing that framework, which is more from an asset, more, more designed for asset allocation, uh, customizing it to sector tilts and within sector stock selection, which is what many of these, most of these funds will actually think of as being the bread and butter activity. Uh, and I'll, I'll show you that, um, that extension in a second. Uh, before I get into that detail, just one quick comment on performance evaluation. So we different ways that people have, have obviously uh, measured performance. Um, you know, here are three, you know, in the context of mean variance efficient frontier, you can certainly look at a fund and compare it to another portfolio or uh, the portfolio of, with the highest sharp ratio. Um, that's kind of the, the, the intuition of, of using the market portfolio. Um, you can uh, compare it to an, uh, other portfolios with the same level of risk and alternatively compare it to other portfolios with the same average return. And uh, we're focusing on the third because what it does is it takes a performance evaluation problem and maps it directly into a mean variance uh, portfolio optimization problem. Um, and so we're going to try to find a benchmark for every manager in our sample that has the same average return as what the manager delivered historically um, under the same constraints that the manager is facing, um, but with less risk. And the hope was, um, as you know, probably most papers do in this literature, is to somehow overturn the puzzle and, and some, somehow take the distribution of manager performance, which is currently solidly centered um, on the negative side, of zero and shift it so it's closer to, you know, perhaps on average zero. And um, the spoiler alert is that we did not manage to do that. Um, even taking into account constraints um, does not overturn the puzzle or the empirical observation that on average, most of these managers in this sample underperform uh, just simple benchmarks. Um, but what it does do, um, it does illustrate in certain examples that we'll, we'll highlight um, the importance of constraints when you're comparing managers to one another. That a manager that um, in a non-constrained fashion might look sort of like a middle of the road average, um, might once taking constraints and mandates into account, um, look more like a star manager within this cohort group. Uh, and, and that's gonna be sort of the, pun the punchline at the end. Um, so uh, we're going to find a benchmark portfolio and, and all I'm doing here is some re rewriting, you know, kind of that benchmark construction as a mean variance portfolio optimization problem. Find a benchmark portfolio that has the same expected or average return as um, our fund does and very importantly imposes the same constraints as um, what the fund manager, um, what he or she faces uh, when solving that problem in the real world. And that uh, leads us to two challenges. One is um, we need to have data on these constraints um, that are being imposed. And secondly, we need to solve a rather difficult mean variance optimization problem. After all, this is you know, what, what um, folks like those managers get ultimately paid for. Um, the first part it turned into a data collection project. Um, and uh, basically what we did is we identified a subset of 
funds that we are interested in. And these are these uh, capital growth, cap these opportunity funds that lie in the center of kind of the middle of you know, index funds and totally unconstrained funds. Um, and for them collected, hand collected um, a list of what they're allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do. What are the, the rules of, of engagement? Um, and then we took, uh, finally uh, took the portfolio optimization um, method that um, we developed earlier for more of an asset allocation framework and uh, changed it a bit up, uh, changed it up a little bit um, in order to resolve these constraint benchmark problems. Um, I already mentioned this, um, the funds that we're going to look at are active mutual funds um, that are uh, focused on um, either um, industry rotation or stock selection within an otherwise pretty vanilla you know, US uh, equities um, universe. Um, again, sitting in between index funds, which arguably are much easier to benchmark and absolute return funds for traditional performance evaluation, just risk adjusted returns probably is the right, right way to think of them because they don't operate under constraints by, by uh, definition. So we started out with 141 um, US domestic capital appreciation funds. Uh, and these are these funds that are um, relatively um, unconstrained in terms of what they can do, except that the universe is well-defined. And so it's easier to, to, to plug these funds into more traditional uh, sort of cross-sectional stock evaluation um, and stock portfolio optimization. Uh, we hand collected from the prospectuses um, various information about what they're allowed to do. And, and specifically what, um, what we collected were, was information about um, what kind of securities um, these, secu these funds were allowed to hold. And I'll, I'll show you a list of uh, more specific data in a second. Um, what the fund is allowed to do in terms of cash investments, leverage, and, and broad investment policy. Um, any other securities funds allowed to invest in, you know, fixed income, derivatives, et cetera, um, whether there is a benchmark um, that the fund was supposed to manage toward and, and or whether there is a volatility target or a um, tracking error uh, target uh, for this particular security. So um, after we went through these funds and looked at also to what extent we had historical data, this turned into somewhat of a small data problem, um, unfortunately. So we ended up with about half of our universe only having more than 10 years of historical data. Um, and that therefore is um, the universe of managers we're gonna look at more specifically. So here's the information we collected. Um, here's uh, in the first box is the security specific information. So the number of securities in the portfolio, oftentimes it's unconstrained as I said, some, some, are, some funds are constrained to have a minimum number of securities uh, as a diversification limit. Others, uh, others have restrictions on um, how many Securities are allowed to be invested in because they're more um, they're more concentrated by design. Uh, the type of securities, whether it's growth or value tilts, whether it's a market cap tilt, uh, to what extent they're either industry focused, um, so it might might be a uh, consumer discretionary fund only, um, or on the other extreme, to what extent it's the fund has to mimic the industry composition of some benchmark, uh, such as the market portfolio uh, and the amount of international holdings. Um, then at the investment policy level, um, to what extent funds are allowed to hold cash, borrow, um, and how actively they're allowed to trade um, the um, securities they're trading, uh, the amount of other securities, and, and one of the big ones here, which we've abstracted from, but it is, but it is an important one, and you know, if you, um, you know, ever read the notices your broker sends, one that obviously is important to managers too, is security lending. Um, which we haven't explicitly incorporated, but it is something that's, you know, all these prospectuses will list as something that the fund either does or does not do. Benchmarks, and then finally, um, whether or not there's a volatility target um, underlying the mandate. Michael, there was another question from um, Umang uh, Ketan. He asked whether you think that by customizing benchmarks, we're diluting the purpose of benchmarking itself. Um, Yes, I think that, and that goes back to what, what Rob said. It, 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 it introduces a second dimension to the um, choice of an end investor um, because you know, one of the things that we ended up documenting is that for the, um, for the funds that we looked at, uh, choosing the right 
constraints is as important as choosing the right manager within its his or her constraints, if that makes sense. And so, um, you know, that's that second dimension of a problem, which, you know, at that point, um, it, it definitely does defeat the whole point, the, the whole idea of, you know, being able to compare two managers to one another. One manager might be a better manager operating under worse constraints for the ultimate outcome of return generation and, and therefore would would reasonably not be as uh, as wise of a choice for an investor and so um that's that's the discussion i think that you know we one would need to have but we're just trying to make the, the simple point that um on the other hand just ignoring these constraints is also not right because there are funds in our sample at least that did a lot better once constraints have been incorporated into their evaluation than they look uh, look like uh, unconditionally when these constraints are ignored. Um, really briefly, and, and uh, for, for the interest of time, just kind of um, skip over much of this, but this is um, just a, a refresher of um, what I had done with Pedro and Rossen on solving similar problems, you know, how to solve large scale portfolio optimization problems, um, where um, in this case, we, I've simplified things. I got rid of the constraints. So it's just um, minimize the variance of a portfolio subject to an expected return target. And uh, the object of uh, portfolio choices, find these time varying um, portfolio weights W that should have little T's on them. Um, because they're time dependent. And, uh, you know, the, the, our approach um, in our paper back then was simply to say, well, those time dependent weights, they're really implicitly functions of uh, one of two sets of variables, either the characteristics of the stock, um, and that could be a firm characteristic or a factor loading, um, or uh, the characteristic of the macro environment. And so therefore, um, what we propose is simply to parameterize um, in a relatively low, low parameter space, um, these optimal portfolio weights as functions of firm characteristics and state variables. And so um, what we proposed uh, specifically is to write the optimal portfolio weight at time T for an investment in firm I as the benchmark weight. Um, so that's kind of the starting point um, from which you would not depart if you didn't really have a reason to. Um, plus, um, deviations from the benchmark weights, which we constructed to be normalized and mean zero in the cross section, so that if you're overweighting a given stock by one dollar um, for whatever reason, a characteristic or a factor exposure, there is a, a matching funding um, a underweighting somewhere else in the cross section, so that your portfolio weights at the end of the day still add up to to be um, a two one. Um, we back then uh, normalized the firm characteristics, which are denoted by C here. So think of this as maybe a standardized version of uh, the size of the book to market value of a firm. It just tells you what kind of firm it is um, and, and therefore uh, determines to what extent you want to tilt into or away from that firm relative to the firm's benchmark weight. Uh, we normalize that by the number of firms in the cross section, just with the very simple intuition that if you had a stock split, and now you had two firms with the same characteristics, you wouldn't, you wouldn't logically want a W investment um, in that particular firm characteristic. Um, and, and therefore it had to somehow be, be normalized in the cross section. Uh, we, we do things a little bit differently in this paper. Um, but once you have a parametric form, so you have a parameterization of how portfolio weights depend on characteristics and parameters, um, the parameters are by assumption, state and time independent so the whole problem unconditions, uh, conditions down, and it becomes an optimization in a low dimensional parameter space theta as opposed to high dimensional weight space W, um, which can be solved. Um, so that's what we did in this paper, except um, we needed to kind of get a little bit more realistic about what kind of portfolios um, a bespoke benchmark would look like, uh, what that would look like given that we're trying to evaluate some relatively sophisticated managers um, and specifically managers that uh, pride themselves on being able to do one of two things, either uh, tactically tilt into certain industries and, and industry groups, and, and therefore end up with an industry composition that looks different than their benchmark, and or um, select individual securities within 
their target universe uh, and overweight them relative to their benchmark weights. And so here's uh, very briefly how we accomplished um, that change. And then I will jump to the empirical results real quick. So each stock we assign to an industry, a style group and a size group. So think of that as kind of a 10 by two by two um, uh, categorization of firms. For each of those categories, we calculate two sets of characteristics for every firm, the average characteristic of the group and the difference of the characteristic of the firm from the group average. The average characteristic of the group basically just describes you know, that industry's characteristic. This is a growth industry versus a value industry. This is a industry with positive momentum and industry with negative momentum. Um, the second set of characteristics, the deviations from the average describe the firm and how it fits into its overall industry group. So this is a winner relative to the rest of the industry or a loser relative to the rest of the industry, or this is a bigger or larger component of an industry group. We then assign different parameters to um, the average characteristics of the firm versus the difference between the characteristics at the firm's characteristics and the industry averages in order to allow the optimal portfolio to tilt either into different industry groups and therefore achieve kind of that first bit that I talked about managers wanting to pick the right industry mix um, to be in particularly maybe at different parts of the business cycle. Um, and on the other hand, allow firms to, to pick out individual securities within an industry to security select. The second uh, thing that we changed relative to um, our original paper is allow the tilt to be asymmetric. Um, and uh, we did that by, by adding two more sets of parameters to the optimal portfolio policy um, so that a underweighting of a firm within an industry didn't have to, doesn't have to be offset by an overweighting of a firm within that same industry, um, for example. So these tilts don't have to be symmetric. Um, that allows you to pick a winner, uh, pick a positive characteristic stock in high tech and offset it or fund it with a uh, not so desirable firm in healthcare, for example, uh, which otherwise wouldn't have been possible. Michael, you have about four minutes. Yep. Let me jump to, the, to what we end up finding. Um, we're going to incorporate five constraints. The investment universe, which is a set of stocks, um, the manager is allowed to invest in, large cap versus a whole US universe or maybe in a specific industry. Borrowing and lending constraints, which turn out to be constraints on these beta coefficients that I briefly flashed before you in, in the previous slide. Short sale constraints, which turn out to be parameter restrictions on the alpha coefficients that, elect, that determine the tilts across industries or the tilt across stocks within an industry. We look at constraints on total turnover and incorporated quadratic transaction costs, kind of a proxy of trading penalties um, in, in the problem in order to make it more realistic. And as Rob said, that's sort of one dimension that the mutual fund literature has moved into. And, um, you know, this is what the data shows, you know, these sort of hypothetical examples that are, the example I showed you earlier actually looks like. So, you know, different mean variance efficient frontiers under uh, empirically now, um, under different constraints. So you have a small cap efficient frontier and a large cap efficient frontier. You have a growth frontier and you have a value frontier. And the extent to which a manager is constrained to be in one subset of the universe or the other is going to determine, you know, which one ought he or she be compared to. Um, there are, you know, obviously constraints that don't allow uh, for much borrowing. Um, there's ones that don't allow for any um, any cash uh, holdings or limited cash holdings. And then finally, short sell constraints, which you know very clearly are very important. Um, so with short selling, with uh, limited short selling or with no short selling. And so when you put all of that together, here's what a, what a now more realistic example might look like. Um, this is a value line fund um, in our sample, one of those um, uh, 70 or so growth opportunity funds. Um, this is the unconditional benchmark to which the fund would have traditionally been compared, um, but it's a large cap fund. It has no cash holdings. It has a constraint on turnover, which now gets us to this red frontier here. And finally, it has a, it's trading in a relative expensive uh, set of securities, which gets us to this blue frontier. And you know, as I sort of suggested earlier, 
we're hoping that we can move this black dot somewhere over here um, and, and conclude that in a larger sample, which we have, um, on average, the funds look like they actually perform up to their benchmark, um, but it turns out they don't. Um, and the degree to which they don't is you know, most intuitively illustrated kind of in, in this picture. So what we have here is a histogram of basically the number of uh, funds in our universe. Um, and what's on this axis is the amount of excess risk the, fund is the funds are taking. Now we normalize by the return of the fund. That's, that's really weird because you potentially could divide by zero, but it turns out all these funds have average, positive average returns. So it gives you a sense of how much more risk do they take to generate one more unit of, of return. Um, and what we start out with is the pink histogram. So you know, all of the funds took more risk than they needed to compared to an unconditional benchmark. And on average, they took about two to, two to 3% more risk than they needed to in order to achieve their, their return uh, realization. Once we cap incorporate the bespoke um, constraints, we're basically shifting that distribution closer towards zero, but we're not centering it at zero. Um, so we find you know, there is a subset of funds that are actually close to perform as well as they could have given the constraints that they've been, been um, uh, imposed on them. But then there's still a relatively large part of the population, importantly, very, you know, no mass of managers on the other side of zero. Um, to, to conclude that you know, we really reverse the puzzle um, and, 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 uh, and show you know, some, some degree of acceptable performance. Um, one final slide, and, and then, I, uh, then I stop talking. Um, this is a ranking chart. And uh, basically what it takes, it, it does is we have 11 value funds in our universe. Um, and so we, we rank those 11 value funds based on the unconditional um, performance relative to just a standard benchmark. And then we did the same thing and we ranked the same funds um, based on their bespoke benchmarks, now incorporating each fund specific constraint um, in the construction of that, um, that bespoke benchmark. And so what happened here, for example, is that there was a fund um, that unconditionally looked like kind of top third to maybe middle of the middle of the pack. Um, that conditionally, once the constraints have been incorporated into the performance evaluation problem, turned out to be the top performing fund in this universe. And likewise, there was, you know, here's your number three fund um, that looked like a top three manager that once you allow, look at the constraints, which must have been relatively lax, uh, laxer than in the case of you know, with the other one that we just discussed, uh, turned out to be not nearly as good. And, and, and once you impose the constraints, it became more of an average fund. And, and that's kind of the point of the, the ultimate punchline of the paper is to say that taking these constraints into account does matter. And it matters particularly when you're trying to line up managers and rank them. Um, because intuitively, the more you constrain the manager, the less they're able to, to um, they're less likely they are to end up being the top performer unconditionally. And I will stop with that. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. Um, so if you could unshare your screen, I'm going to uh, give it over to our discussant, uh, who is Clemens Sialm from UT Austin. So Clemens, you have 10 minutes. And while Clem is getting started, let me just remind you again, you could ask questions in the chat and we'll get to them in the Q&A if, if time permits. Okay. Great, I thank very much the organizers for asking me to discuss this paper. It's a fun paper and it's on a important uh, topic. Mutual fund managers face significant investment constraints, constraints which should reduce their performance. And this paper proposes a new benchmark that incorporates the impact of those constraints. And I have five main comments on the discussion. Uh, the first comment is on the objective uh, function. Uh, the authors use a expected utility maximization uh, where they and uh, they maximize over the return of a fund, which is a collection of different individual securities. And to make this, mod, uh, this optimization tractable and more stable, they use the linear parameterization from an influential paper by Michael Pedro and Drossen. And there, the weights, they have to be a function of the characteristics. Like first, there's the benchmark weight, 
And then you have as well the active weight, which depends on the characteristics of the stocks and the characteristics that they use is size, book to market and momentum. And the utility function is uh, constant relative risk aversion. And then in a third step, they include various portfolio constraints for investment style, cash, short sales, turnover, and transactions costs. And this is really useful to, to understand how important or how binding are those constraints. And this linear parametrization is actually very powerful because it reduces the dimensionality and many asset managers use similar approaches to, to, to form their portfolios. And here's the example from value line that Michael as well showed. We see here the fund, it has a return of about 9% over this time period and the standard deviation of 20%. And if we compare it to an unconstrained benchmark, which is shown here in red, we would argue that the fund is uh, underperforming dramatically. Alternatively, you could as well look at the return difference here and, and that might even appear to be bigger. And now we see how those different constraints affect the, um, the performance. The first constraint is here to focus on the universe of large cap stocks. Of course, that doesn't allow you such a high diversification. And then the second big change is actually once you impose uh, no borrowing or, or no lending constraint, and then you have here a curve, a portfolio frontier. And the other constraints in this example, the turnover constraint, sector neutrality and transactions costs are relatively minor. And therefore, most of the difference is actually driven by those two first constraint, the investment universe and the cash. But still, even in this case, the fund would still uh, underperform. It has a higher standard deviation than those portfolios. And here is an, another example uh, where the second constraint, the cash constraint, is relatively more important. Now, my main comment about the objective function is that, that a typical mutual fund investor is fairly well diversified. According to the ICI, a me, the median mutual fund investor owns five different mutual funds. One of them might be a Vanguard index fund and others might be more specialized funds. And a second part is as well that the mutual fund investor can adjust portfolio leverage by buying or by doing homemade leverage with treasury securities, bank accounts, or maybe even taking advantage of secured loans like mortgages. And therefore some of this uh, improvement can be done by the investors as well. And therefore the utility of an investment depends not just on the performance of one individual fund, it depends on the complete portfolio of all the different assets held by the fund that that makes as well the total risk of the portfolio potentially less relevant than its contribution to the risk. What we would want is actually how much does that fund contribute to the overall uh, portfolio. And in the industry, people often use the information ratio which compares benchmark adjusted returns with uh, the tracking error and potentially the authors could look more at constraints or alternative measures like this. I think they could adjust their, their, uh, their problem to, to using alternative measures. Now, a second point is that the index benchmark that is most frequently used in practice actually is already very highly constrained. It's a fixed investment universe. There's no cash holdings, typically no leverage. Typically there's no short selling and the turnover is minimal. And therefore what is currently done in practice is to compare the fund with one of those index benchmarks. Obviously as people have shown there as well some issues with manipulation of the benchmark with selective choice of benchmarks. And therefore that's not a perfect uh, solution either. But the most commonly used benchmarks are highly constrained. And here in, in this graph that we looked at before, I show as well the, I added the S&P 500 fund or the S&P index without fees. 
And that had a return of almost 12% in the standard deviation of about 16%. And therefore as well outperformed the fund uh, quite a bit. But it is interesting that this highly constrained portfolio is aligning pretty well with the green uh, or somewhere between the green and the, the uh, red or purple curve here. Now, um, in academia, people have used factor-based performance measures, or I, th I see the paper actually closest to holdings-based performance measure. For example, Danny and Grim Grimblad, Titman and Wormers match the stocks held by a fund with similar stocks and compare the performance or Hoberg, Kumar, and Prabala in a recent paper, they as well find customized benchmark for each individual fund by looking at the other funds that hold similar styles. But again, those papers don't look as, or they don't look at other constraints like short selling constraints. And, and that is a, a very nice contribution of the current paper. The third comment I have is what I call out of sample performance. The characteristics used in the portfolio optimization are market cap, book to market, and momentum. And optimizing over these characteristics results in very high maximum sharp ratios, like the in-sample one is 1.2 and the out-of-sample is 1. And the reason for that is that size, book to market, and momentum uh, way important factors over this time period, but the out of sample results are not truly out of sample since they rely on those characteristics that have been shown to do well over this time period. And for example, value over the last 10 years hasn't done as well. And therefore, maybe the benchmarks, especially the unconstrained benchmarks might actually be uh, very hard to achieve because some of those characteristics are picked ex exposed. Um, my fourth comment is on economic significance. Um, I really like the comparison where funds are compared using before and after adjusting for constraints. And this is the same graph that Michael showed as well. And we see some difference here, for example, for value, it's uh, uh, the two measures are not as highly correlated, but for example, for large cap funds, it's pretty high. And if we compute the rank correlations, that's actually 98%, but for value, it's 75 or 0 0.75, the, the correlation. And to, to see whether this is high or low, I, computed CAPM alphas and Fama French alphas, just to, to get a comparison with what would you get uh, using different measures and but something that we understand relatively well, like if we add the two factors. And here it's all done within the style groups, like large growth, large value. And the rank correlations are actually lower, especially once we focus on large cap stocks um, when we would compare the rank of CAPM and Fama French alphas. And the sample here is constructed in a similar way um, as what Michael did in their paper, although I have a, a bigger sample since I don't need the, the constraints. But that shows that um, there is definitely some impact, especially among small capitalization and value funds, but it's not as large as going from the CAPM to the Fama French alphas. And the last point is was brought up by Rob and as well in the presentation. Constraints and mandates are selected by fund advisors, boards for several reasons. It's an endogenous choice. Investors care about those constraints. And reasons to impose constraints might be to monitor your managers for risk management. It could be family diversification strategies like a family might want a small value fund, even if they don't think small value is really a promising area. And they might as well have, on the other hand, a large growth fund. And they want to separate those funds for family diversification strategies. 
constraints might as well, for example, be for taxes. If your investors are taxable, uh, then you might want to avoid realizing short-term capital gains and you want, might want to encourage the loss, tax loss harvesting. And that wouldn't be directly reflected in, in performance, but it would benefit your investors. And finally, constraints might as well attract flows. Like some of your investors might not want to buy mutual funds that uh, buy derivatives because they think derivatives are very risky, like Warren Buffett said, weapons of mass destruction. And, and therefore you can actually increase flows by constraining yourself. And now the question is whether you should incorporate these constraints when evaluating a fund's performance. And it might matter who you look at. If you look at the investor, or if you look at the fund family that tries to compensate its managers. I think it makes more sense when you think about a fund family that wants to decide whether a manager added value to the portfolio, then you want to uh, take into account the constraints. But if you look at the broad fund investor, you want as well to see what the impact of the constraints themselves are, whether those make sense or not. I have a couple of additional uh, smaller comments that I can discuss with the authors, but overall it's a fascinating paper. It led me to think about a lot of important questions and uh, it shows as well that those constraints have a big impact on the portfolios. Thank you so much, Clemens. Um, so we're learning, running slightly late. So I'm just gonna go straight to some questions from the chat here. Um, we're gonna to try to have the question and askers to ask them live in person. So I'm gonna start out uh, with uh, Joan Gomez from IE Business School. Joan, are you with us? Hi. Hey. Hello. Do you hear me? Hear you well. Okay, fine. So very quickly, uh, is, is related to, to Clement's point, um, the idea that the benchmark is actually part of the solution, which should be the outcome of a problem where the, the constraints uh, you know, are already set, so it's endogenous. So it was, I mean, I know it's besides the point of the paper, but uh, have you thought about what is the underlying problem? So say that the fund wants to actually find, build this uh, bespoke benchmark. So what is the problem that you, you have in mind? Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. I, I don't have an answer. Um, I, I, it's a really well taken point. They're absolutely endogenous. Um, I actually think you know, the alignment of end investor utility with fund manager actions has you know, clearly something to do with it as well. And you know, those are not two separate problems uh, because one way that you can obviously incentivize the manager to do what you want him to do is constrain him to not do something you know, mm -hmm. far away from the optimum. Um, so those are all great. I, I just don't know how to formulate the initial point. And, and you know, as, as Rob suggested in the ESG case, which is, you know, mm -hmm. probably a better, better laboratory to study this in, you know, it's fascinating just the different definitions of what ESG means. So, you know, the, the man of the investor's first job is to find the right ESG definition provider. Um, before even thinking about what manager to hire, because that's going to be first order for what kind of securities end up in the portfolio. Thank you. Um, I want to just really quickly while, while we switch to somebody else, but you know, that point about the ex post picking of the characteristics is uh, absolutely well taken. Um, you know, that I think applies to pretty much any. Uh, paper that uses you know these features for any sort of ex post evaluation, but it, it's important to keep in mind. Great. Um, okay, so let's go to the next question by Alan Zhang. Alan. Hello, Alan. Hello. Hey, we can oh, hear you. Sorry. <laughs> um, um, the, the main question I had was just, um, was the data around the fund constraints uh, the main limiting factor in conducting this study more broadly? Yeah, it, it was the, it, it was the binding constraint for, you know, in, in one direction, um, you know, Clem's point about the market being the appropriate, already very constrained um, benchmark is, is absolutely valid. If you have an index fund that only has a, you know, 10, 25, 50 basis point tracking error relative to its benchmark, you know, 
the, the benchmarking problem has already been taken care of. And, and on the other hand, um, you know, if you look at prospectuses of very largely un, uh, unconstrained funds, you know, you're kind of missing the point because there's no constraint to incorporate. So it, it, it was a fairly subtle search to try to identify a set of, mat, a set of mutual funds for, with it, for which this is actually a, a really important problem. Um, and not to let the empirical work thing get contaminated by funds for which it clearly isn't an issue. Yeah, that's fair, thanks. Uh, great, let's take uh, one last question. Um, next question is from uh, Valeria Fedek. Uh, Valeria? Um, yes, I was wondering, did you consider taking into account also the timing of flows as a kind of ongoing additional constraint that could obfuscate the fund rankings? For instance, if a fund suffered a very large redemption with significant trading impact, even though the manager was skilled and the performance might not be as good as expected. Yeah, we did not. Um, so the, the work we did is, is all averages, historical averages. So it would average out any big flows that um, might have impacted performance. Um, also, you know, when we look at things like cash holdings, you know, these are average cash holdings, not um, around big flows or anticipated flows. Mm -hmm. uh, great. Okay, so we are uh, closing in on the second uh, session here, but uh, we have a minute left. So, Michael, do you want to comment on Clement's uh, discussion? The, they were all great, great comments. Thank you very much. I, I think yeah, they're all well taken. And, um, you know, I, I think that the biggest issue to me still is the endogeneity of the constraints. Um, and, and you know, really, the point that that's being highlighted, I think, is that investors are buying constraints probably more so than they're act than they're buying manager skill. Um, and so, understanding that that problem, I, I think, is, is ultimately going to be important. 